Ah, Brazil. Home of sword meets, T-pose Jesus, and grisly security camera footage. A country whose passions run as deeply as their rainforest, and that passion rages straight into their politics. Authorities promised to restore order after huge protests in support of ex-president Jair Bolsonaro. And they're taking their anger out on anything they can find. On January 8th, supporters of the recently ousted Brazilian president filmed themselves in a spicy South American remake of America's own hilarious failed coup. Bolsonaro fans stormed the Capitol building, the Supreme Court, and the presidential office, conveniently when no one was home. You probably saw it on the news and moved on with your life, but I don't have one, so I dug deeper. I've spent the last week scouring footage, translating Portuguese YouTube videos, and speaking to dozens of informed Brazilians so ignorant gringos like me can make sense of it all. And it turned out this was my kind of story. It is about how the internet is driving and deranging public discourse. Later in this video, I'll break down a detailed timeline of exactly what happened on the day, after we've all gorged on the juicy, salty, sword-mounted context. Because the events of January 8th are the culmination of a longer, deeper, fascinating story that for narrative convenience, we'll say started in 2013. 2013 was a simpler time. Brazilians were enjoying nearly a decade of strong economic growth and the alt-rock rap stylings of Charlie Brown Jr. President Juma Rousseff of the center-left Worker Party held strong support after two years leading a 17-party coalition. That was until the summer. What had begun as a local movement to protest an increase in Sao Paulo bus fare quickly morphed into two weeks of nationwide demonstrations against government corruption and the militarized police force. <laughs> Tear gas was fired into crowds with such frequency that advice spread to use a vinegar-soaked rag to breathe through to counteract the effects. That advice doesn't actually work, but it didn't stop the police from confiscating bottles of the salad dressing from protesters and journalists. In reaction, the Brazilian internet burst with ironic memes calling for the legalization of vinegar. V for vinegar became an online rallying cry against police violence as the vinegar uprising spread to the federal capital of Brasilia in scenes that will look familiar to anyone living in 2023. Many local governments agreed to reduce the cost of bus fare, and on June 6th, 16th, the federal government was pushed to authorize vinegar possession for protest and salad improving purposes. So why am I telling you about this completely unrelated protest from 10 years ago? Well, nearly all of the Brazilians I spoke to told me what a big deal this moment was. Most of the protesters were in their teens or early 20s, while the boomer press labeled them as delinquents and even terrorists. Brazilians look back on these protests as an inflection point where the country became more politically engaged, but also more polarized between the left and the right, as well as between the old and the young. It was also an incredible case study in the power of the Brazilian internet. Brazilians in general are very online. The country has one of the largest internet using populations in the world, and they are some of its most dedicated posters. Brazilians love to express themselves online, and they are very, very good at it. Just take a short glance at Brazilian meme culture and you'll see layers of irony and tasty viral tidbits that trend towards the politically inflammatory. There is also a lot of mistrust for mainstream news because print and broadcast outlets are often funded directly by mainstream political parties. Seremos simples e direto. As mídias de rádio e TV dizem que não temos uma causa específica. So even back in 2013, young Brazilians saw information on the internet as more trustworthy and authentic. This anonymous video played a memorable role in mobilizing the vinegar revolution. Now famous YouTubers like Cauê Moura and Felipe Neto started their careers sharing support for the protests in viral, now deleted videos. This internet infected petri dish was the perfect breeding ground for a little known political bacterium to spread his influence. 
In 2013, Jair Bolsonaro was a nobody, a federal deputy in the small, mostly irrelevant Christian Democratic Party. But he had gained some notoriety for his guest appearances on Brazil's favorite satirical news show, CQC, roughly translated as Whatever It Takes. Comedians on the show would investigate politicians and mock them in interviews. Bolsonaro was brought on for people to laugh at because of the stupid, ignorant shit he said. What would you do if you were to take your son and take a cigarette? You would give him a beat. You can have certainty of that. You would torture him? If you act with energy and torture him, Vai ser torturado. O que você faria se você tivesse um filho gay? Isso nem passa pela minha cabeça que tiver uma boa educação. Eu fui um pai presente, então não corro esse risco. But many older Brazilians appreciated him for saying the stuff which they believed, but felt like they could no longer say. A reputation that would prove very useful in the coming years. Now it's time for the Surfshark ad. With Surfshark, you can travel the world, virtually. I mean, why browse memes in cold grey London when you can browse them in sunny, still very cold Rotterdam? Get yourself some better deals on clogs and stroop waffles wherever you are. It is actually an essential tool when you are traveling in the real world, as you can use it to encrypt your data on public Wi-Fi wherever you are. I use Surfshark because of their strict no logs policy, which means they never collect your data no matter what. Say you want to share some spicy protest footage with your favorite YouTuber, you can use Surfshark's IP rotator to constantly change your device's IP address without losing your VPN connection. Get past geolocks and government restrictions and secure yourself online. Find out more in the link below and get 83% off and free months completely free with my promo code Ordinary Things. You've got nothing to lose when Surfshark has a 30 day money back guarantee. The years leading up to Bolsonaro's election were characterized by growing anger around flagrant government corruption and some world class sporting events that weren't unrelated. In 2014, a Supreme Court investigation known as Operation Car Wash revealed to the public just how corrupt Brazil's political class was. Investigators indicted and jailed well-known leaders, including former presidents. What began as a simple money laundering investigation snowballed to uncover government corruption on the scale of a megastructure. Vastly more money than was necessary was being poured into large scale construction contracts for things like hydroelectric dams, metro stations, and yeah, Olympic and World Cup stadiums. With Brazil hosting the World Cup in 2014 and the Olympics in 2016, these stadiums, slap bang in the middle of poorly managed cities, were eyesore evidence of political officials embezzling government cash. It's hard to overstate just how deep this corruption infected Brazilian politics without making a whole video on it, but one statistic illustrates it well. A 2017 Miami Herald report revealed that when Operation Car Wash began in 2014, fewer than 10,000 electronic monitoring bracelets were being used to enforce house arrests. By 2017, that number had more than doubled to 24,000. And we all know it weren't street level criminals who were serving their sentence at home. Between the World Cup and the Olympics, this scandal shredded President Juma and her party's reputation. She was charged with criminal administrative misconduct, though never actually convicted. But this was enough for a Senate filled with politicians who were just as guilty as her to vote for her impeachment. Bolso the Clown took his moment in the spotlight with a sickly, sentimental speech that showed nostalgia for Brazil's 1964 coup d'etat that began three decades of military dictatorship. President Juma was impeached and replaced by her deeply unpopular deputy, Michel Temer, and she didn't take it very well. My government has been undergoing sabotage. With a self-righteous and unapologetic attitude that might give Americans flashbacks to their own 2016 candidate for president. Referring to her impeachment as a coup and showing little contrition for her party's role in democratic Brazil's biggest ever corruption scandal soured public support. What we in the government believe, and what my supporters believe, is that the ongoing impeachment process is illegitimate and illegal because it is ultimately based on a lie. Her replacement faced protests, multiple impeachment attempts, and held a 7% approval rating in the lead up to the 2018 election, 
which he smartly chose not to stand in. Former President Lula da Silva was put forward as PT's candidate, but early in the campaign, he too was caught up in Operation Car Wash, sentenced to over nine years in jail by Supreme Court Judge Sergio Moro in a hugely controversial decision. Now, this is something that English language reporting often leaves out when covering Brazil, which really pisses me off because it's crucial. Supreme Court judges in Brazil have a lot of power, and they are often accused of overreaching and using that power for political gain, by both sides of the political spectrum. Sergio Moro became a media darling during Operation Car Wash for the speed and severity with which he imposed sentences on politicians. But his convenient timing in imposing Lula's conviction was extremely controversial, with some celebrating the collection of such a high-profile scout, while others seeing it as election meddling. Moro described himself as apolitical, and that he didn't want that kind of career, but then accepted the role of Minister of Justice in Bolsonaro's government the following year. If you're Brazilian, whether you see this as kind of intentional play or not, kind of depends where you sit on the political spectrum. But it's undeniable that the institutional rot laid bare by Operation Car Wash is what enabled Bolsonaro's rise to power. Bolsonaro's 2018 campaign is one of the most dramatic in recent world history, featuring that banging campaign song and his own stabbing. As a retired military officer and committed Christian, he solidified a loyal base by evoking nostalgia for Brazil's military dictatorship and uh, throwing out the occasional homophobic insult. But he also gained support from the unaligned, who watched him speak out emotionally against government corruption. A violência só cresce no Brasil exatamente porque é uma equivocada política de direitos humanos. Bolsonaro excelled during television debates, like this one, which dealt with the wide field of candidates by pitting them against one another in timed one-on-one -on -one rap battles. Here, Bolsonaro's informal and emotional style helped him stand out against his repressed opponents who represented the corrupt establishment. Temos aqui uma evangélica que defende um plebiscito para aborto. In most democracies, television and print media protect the interest of the political status quo. Maybe a little partisan, but outlets are basically aligned with a mainstream political party. This is true in Brazil, but even more so. That should be the country's motto. Yes, but more so. When Bolsonaro appeared on Journal Nacional's rotating microwave dish, he attacked the network for receiving billions in government cash. You live in grande part here de recursos da União. São bilhões que recebem o Sistema Globo de recursos da propaganda oficial do governo. And Bolsonaro wasn't wrong. Grupo Globo received over 10 billion reais between 2000 and 2016 from federal state advertising. In calling this shit out, he gained support beyond his base, sowing distrust in the previous government and in the traditional media they were funding. Broadcast media and the internet painted wildly divergent narratives during the 2018 election, which Bolsonaro's team understood better than anyone. A huge drama YouTuber, Nando Mora, initially made a name for himself by attacking other creators, but from 2016, he basically became a Bolsonaro stan account. He interviewed Bolsonaro on two separate occasions, while also making time to totally shred Axe in a music video mocking mainstream news for giving a fuck about the Amazon rainforest. <laughs> Mora wasn't alone. YouTubers played a big role in winning centrist and anti-corruption votes for Bolsonaro. But the events of January 8th, which we're getting to, I promise, have more to do with another online group that Brazilians call Chios dos Apps, or WhatsApp Uncles. By 2018, it wasn't just young people who were being mobilized by the internet, as the older generations were getting their fake facts from WhatsApp and Telegram groups. Unlike YouTubers, where there is a big, ugly, ringlit face to take the flack for spreading misinformation, these groups are anonymous echo chambers. They are 
bullshit incubators that function like chat rooms, where conspiracy theories are amplified and even mildly dissenting voices are rejected. I've been investigating groups like this one on Telegram, which Brazilians tell me is a typical example. They vary in size, they might have 50 or 50,000 members, but they intersect with the same sources and clips recurring in all of them. And that's because there is a lot of manipulation going on in the background, as rich Bolsonaro supporters have used devices to spam these groups with propaganda. These devices can send over 300,000 messages at a time and were used to spread outright bullshit. In 2018, lies spread about Bolsonaro's eventual opponent, Fernando Haddad, the former mayor of Sao Paulo. These WhatsApp uncles were told that Haddad had equipped schools with erotic baby bottles with dick-shaped teats, apparently to combat homophobia. Obviously, this is mental, but clips like this spread across WhatsApp unchallenged and many believed them. It is the older, frankly bigoted generation that were whipped into a frenzy by these groups. These were the people who demolished the Brazilian capital on January 8th, but they aren't the only ones responsible. So this isn't a video about what a terrible president Bolsonaro was. This is about the cascade of events that led to January 8th. But if you want the uh, too long didn't read version, massive deforestation in the Amazon, corruption scandals on par with his predecessors, and a terrible mishandling of the pandemic. He did cut taxes for the first time since the end of the country's military dictatorship, which was popular, but the subsequent cuts in public service spending prepared the country poorly for COVID. Living up to his tough boy persona, he claimed his athletic physique would protect him from the virus. But due to complications from his stabbing injury, Bolsonaro was in and out of hospital more often than a chain-smoking nurse. As his own scandals mounted, he lost the small section of the middle ground that had won him the election. In 2020, the same Supreme Court judge that had thrown Bolsonaro's biggest rival in jail left his government after serving just 15 months, while YouTubers like Nando Mora, who had supported him during the election, abandoned him during his presidency. They had embraced him as an agent of change, but as he negotiated with Brazil's big center, they no longer saw him that way. So Bolsonaro and his team progressively relied on the rabid enthusiasm of his loyal supporters. You know, these guys. The ones trying to talk to aliens with phones on their heads. As early as 2021, Bolsonaro said that the country's electronic voting machines were riddled with fraud. In response, a different Supreme Court judge, which he didn't appoint, Alexandra de Moraes, started an investigation into Bolsonaro's baseless claims. Bolsonaro has been gunning for de Moraes throughout his presidency, especially after the court squashed the conviction of Lula da Silva, the once and future president. Since then, Bolsonaro has made sure that the Supreme Court has been enemy number one for the WhatsApp uncles, who were getting more deranged by the day. In September of the same year, Bolsonaro supporters were already blocking highways in scenes that preceded the Freedom Convoy in Canada. But a big difference here was that the truck drivers did so because they claimed Bolsonaro had declared a state of emergency. Meus amigos e minhas amigas de todo o Brasil, desculpa pela emoção. Other rumors spread that the president would soon expand the power of the executive and dismiss the Supreme Court entirely. None of this ended up happening, but many of his supporters believed the rumors that were spreading through WhatsApp. And the problem with these groups is that the way they intersect mean that you never really know where the information starts. And that's crucial to understanding why this stuff is so messy. The 2022 election was just as dramatic as 2018's, but this time the anti-Bolsonaro songs were catchier than his own. Lula da Silva's campaign stole the centre-right from under Bolsonaro's tubed-up nose. And the man himself was finally sick of all those YouTuber nobodies sticking cameras in his face. After four years of WhatsApp conspiracies and a more polarised political climate, violence had become commonplace. 
An Amnesty International survey found that there was at least one case of political violence every two days in the lead up to the first round of voting. This included straight up murders and also intimidation of voters. Lula da Silva ended up winning the election with just 50.9% of votes. And after such a tight, violent contest, it is no surprise that the Bolsonaro loyalists weren't happy about it. Truck drivers and crowds began blocking highways. More than 300 roads in 25 states were blockaded with burning tires, with little intervention from the highway police. By the 3rd of November, these supporters looked like they'd run out of gasoline, so they just dumped one big tire in the middle of the road and started singing to it. The Bolso fanatics might be the flattest tires on the road, but you've got to admire their commitment. Like this water brain who kept trying to stop this truck from moving even after it had been using him as a hood ornament for the better part of two hours. While these protests continued in the background, Bolsonaro directly challenged the legitimacy of the election, arguing again that votes from some of the machines should be invalidated. Traffic was blocked for weeks in an attempt to slow the country's supply chain, while other Bolso minions moved their tantrum to the sidewalk next to military bases, living in hope that if they cried hard enough, the army would step in and do their coup for them. And they weren't completely crazy for thinking this might happen. There is a lot of Bolsonaro support in the military and within the government, as we'll see later on. The camp outside the main military headquarters in Brasilia became the setting off point for the eventual coup attempt and was well funded. There was even a large plush tent meant only for the YouTubers and podcasters keeping eyes on the protests. The rest of these camps were nothing more than roadside shanty towns, sustained by the most diehard supporters who either had nothing better to do or were completely out of their minds. These people see conspiracy in everything. Even the rain, which became a significant obstacle for these cracked out campers. Whatever you say, lady. While his supporters were getting soaked, Bolsonaro put on his own waterworks, delivering a final tearful live stream before logging off and moving to the States. 48 hours before his term came to an end, Bolsonaro took his diplomatic visa and hightailed it to the land of far-right retirees and golf course gators. He was spotted on January 3rd, wandering the Orlando suburbs. The guest of mixed martial arts fighter Jose Aldo, a fervent supporter and big-time Minions fan if the decorations in his guest bedroom are anything to go by. There's no proof that this is where Bolsonaro was spending his sleepless nights or that it's where he watched his opponent's January 1st inauguration, but that's how Brazilian meme artists have chosen to imagine it. While the former president was busy deciding which sauce he wanted on his chicken tender pub sub, his own yellow-clad minions kept the fight alive. One keen supporter showed his commitment by climbing the spotlight of Ahuda Stadium in Recife and refused to climb down until Jair was president again. But on WhatsApp, things were getting more organized as codes and voice notes were being used to plan a march on the National Congress. Okay, with all that context out of the way, we're all now educated enough to understand what happened on January 8th. Using some open source intelligence skills and the dedicated input of my Brazilian correspondents, I've put this together. This is the story of Brazil's failed coup. January 7th. More than 100 buses arrive in the federal capital of Brasilia, dumping thousands of Bolso supporters outside the army headquarters where the coup-brewing hopefuls have been camped out for months. From these photos, on January 6th, we can see that the camp had been thinning to almost total abandonment. But that all changed with the arrival of the buses. Brazilian authorities are still investigating who funded this mass minion migration, but it's clear that the individuals and companies who did were largely responsible for what happened next. By the morning of the 8th, just under 4,000 demonstrators were gathered outside the military headquarters. Most of them seem to be in their 40s and 50s, but every age group is accounted for. 
the crowds continue to gather unopposed by the military next door and readied themselves to move. 1 p.m. Just after 1 p.m., the crowd begins its seven kilometer march from the military headquarters to the National Congress. They are accompanied by a tiny contingent of police officers who make sure these stupider members of the crowd don't wander into traffic. 2.30 p.m. By 2.30, the Bolson arsonists are marching towards the center of Free Powers Plaza, a large open space between the Supreme Court and the presidential office. But at exactly 2.42, the group of protesters move in unison and make a sharp turn towards the National Congress lawn that they were walking past. They easily overwhelm the flimsy metal barricade and the dozen or so district police officers standing behind it. Now, there were two different police forces in the federal capital on the 8th, the district's federal police and the military police. And as we see more footage, we'll see a stark difference in how each force does their job. The district police were officially tasked with patrolling the event, though their presence was much smaller than usual. Blame is now being leveled at the district security chief, Anderson Torres, who only started the role on January 2nd after previously serving as Bolsonaro's justice minister. It looks like Torres has been following Bolsonaro's lead in more ways than one, as he has taken his family and his haircut to Disneyland, Florida, two days before this demonstration and four days after starting the job. By 3 p.m., protesters have completely overrun the lawn in front of the National Congress, while others continue on to Three Powers Plaza. Here, they did find some resistance. Horse-mounted district police try to control the flow of human traffic on the plaza to little success as Bolso supporters live stream themselves removing a cop from his horse for anyone who couldn't make it to the protest. One police car weaves through the gaps in a futile attempt to intimidate people away from the presidential office. Back at Congress, another drives straight into the drink, where it quickly becomes a background for photo shoots and soy jack selfies. By this time, the ramp leading to the Congress's roof is packed with supporters. Scattered groups below smash the glass windows on the ground floor and enter the building, meeting little resistance, eventually making their way into the heart of the Senate, where they are faced with the fact that nobody's home and there's nothing to do except smash the place up. A similar pattern emerged at the entrance of the Supreme Court at 3.45 p.m., which they enter with barely a hint of resistance. The flag-clad rioters demolish the courtrooms, setting off the sprinklers and tossing the expensive-looking furniture outside. From the second floor, protesters get a good view of the final break-in on the other side of the plaza. In the presidential office, the vandalism is more targeted and more severe. With no president to direct their anger at, they settle on the next best thing, the portraits of his predecessors. They even smash this 17th century grandfather clock, a gift from the French to Brazil's king. With nobody home in any of the country's bases of power, Bolsonaro's supporters could only target their stuff. Back in the Supreme Court, protesters have revenge on their mind, as they invade the office of Alexandre de Moraes, Bolsonaro's sworn enemy for the last four years. They start by sitting in his chair. That'll show him. Others decide to take souvenirs like the judge's robes. And in the case of one little rascal, his office door, which is paraded around outside the court moments later. After the office has been ransacked, a real upstanding patriot attempts to take a shit in the office, but he gets a little camera shy before the deed is done. As if the tone couldn't be lowered any further, another man parades a bag full of sex toys around, claiming to have found them in the office of the Supreme Court judge, and which he definitely didn't bring with him. The enormous crowd now occupies every floor of the Congress building, with those on the rooftop unfurling a banner that reads, We Want the Source Code, a reference to the ghost in the voting machines targeted by Bolsonaro in November. And on the ground floor, Someone started a fire. After over an hour of uninterrupted chaos, camouflaged forces arrive to retake the Supreme Court. Supporters greet them with cheers, believing that their dreams of coup are about to come true. Observing the inaction of the military police present for the last hour meant that this hope wasn't just the usual 
but also bullshit delusion. Minutes before, military police officers were filmed taking a very uh, laid-back approach to the ransacking of the country's free seats of power, with one officer presumably filming the chaos for his YouTube channel. At around 4.30 p.m., the Bolso Massif cheer the late arrival of the shock cavalry, who head first to the presidential office. When they arrive in the building, a man in army uniform tries to stop these shock troops from entering the palace in a tense exchange. Protesters who didn't get to smash up the building before the shock cops arrived set fire to the abandoned cars out front of Congress, as others make content slash evidence out of their crimes. It's only then that the confusion really sets in for the protesters as the newly arrived district police force make their first arrest on the Congress lawn. As federal police helicopters fire tear gas onto the crowds below, the less committed coup plotters are the first to slowly disperse. Inside the presidential office, shock cops command the remaining protesters to sit, announcing that the party is over, which it very much is. <laughs> By 8 o'clock, footage emerges of protesters sitting on the pavement outside in handcuffs, as the governor of Brasilia announces that 400 people have been arrested before the day's end. The coup camp was cleared by the military the following day. What was left of it looked like the aftermath of a natural disaster. Those that escaped arrest on the day were back to their old tricks the following afternoon, blocking highways around the capital with burning rubber. Approximately 1,500 rioters were eventually arrested, and lucky for us, they still had enough battery on their phone to document themselves being processed. On WhatsApp and Telegram, onlookers compared the arrest to the Holocaust, as rumours spread that arrestees were receiving forced vaccinations. Calls for another mega mobilization also spread in these groups in the days that followed, but they failed to materialize. But for every legion of WhatsApp uncles in cuffs, there is a haircut in a suit that stood to benefit. Anderson Torres, the former Bolsonaro justice minister who ensured that there would be a reduced security presence in the capital, is arrested on his return to Brazil on the 14th of January. At his home, police reportedly discovered documents that would have been used to legitimize the reversal of October's election results. Which Torres tries to explain on Twitter that these documents were just taken out of context. Obviously, this story is still developing. But whatever happens next for Brazil, President Lula has a tough battle ahead of him to restore unity, while many in the military and in the government still hold loyalty to the previous administration. Before you go, I just wanna share two things I learned while making this video. Number one, Brazilians rule. The people I spoke to for research were funny, passionate, and so engaged with the world at large, I couldn't have made it without them. And two, toxic online conspiracy theories are not unique to Brazil. They are a challenge for all democracies in 2023. But what's important to understand is that they are symptoms of a disease, not the disease itself. People turn to angry politics and alternative narratives when rotting institutions refuse to show them a future worth believing in. Yes, there are crazy, evil people in this world, but they only get a foothold when the sensible ones stop giving a shit. That's it from me. Thanks for watching the video. Hit like if you liked, subscribe to the channel, maybe, and don't let the bastards grind you down. See you next time. It's a bit of B-roll.